Hello and welcome to the Thrive Co-Living Communities broadcast. Um, my name is Jennifer Hooper. I'm here with my co-host Mark Stein. Mark, hello. Hi there. <laughs> Mark is, back. yes, always glad to see you. Mark is the founder of Thrive Co-Living Communities and today we have a special guest. I love all of our guests and this one is going to be as juicy as all the others. Hi Gail, how are you Hi. today? I'm good. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> awesome. Just, how we often are, doing... are you introduced as Juicy, Gail? In <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, love it. I love it. <laughs> uh, we are here today with Gail Van Gills, I believe. Did I pronounce that last name yeah, correctly? Um, and Gail is an author, consultant, and life coach. One of her specialties is mindfulness, which I certainly support and love and abide by. But at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Gail and let her tell us a little bit more uh, about herself and, and what her business is called. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much, Jennifer. Uh, my business is called Transform Your Culture. Um, and basically, I work with um, personal culture and corporate culture. So I do work with um, companies, particularly with smaller companies that are really am interested in aligning their values, their vision, and what they're really doing on the ground with their customers. And so um, that's wonderful work. And for that, I use a lot of um, tools from the Barrett Value Center. So that's, that's really wonderful material. Uh, I also work with um, emotional intelligence. I'm a certified meta coach. That's like the coach, the coaches, the coaches <laughs> from the um, Daniel Goleman, um, uh, well, Daniel Goleman Emotional Intelligence Center, it's new. And Daniel Goleman, as you may know, is the author who brought emotional intelligence forward um, some time ago with the books that are so popular. So anyway, I've, I've been practicing that both as a coach and as a trainer, I'm a certified search inside yourself trainer. Search inside yourself came out of Google where um, they began applying mindfulness as a tool for developing um, emotional intelligence and leadership with their employees. And it was so incredibly successful that they um, spun off a not-for-profit to train other people such as myself who had the, the right background in business and mindfulness to bring this to the world. That's just a few of the things I do. I do so many <laughs> things. It's kind of crazy. So I, I think I'll stop there. <laughs> well, that's amazing. That's a great introduction. And you've introduced me some things that I have not uh, heard of. And I am a life coach as well. But the search inside yourself, uh, that sounds really, really interesting. And uh, obviously, emotional intelligence is something that I think is important. <clears throat> um, Mark, why don't you ask the next question? I'll have sure. lob it so, over to you. <laughs> so I'll catch it. Um, <clears throat> so Gail, we really uh, appreciate you being on the podcast. And I think what I'd like to start out with is to ask you, you know, you, you understand the general concept of the Thrive Co-Living Communities. Uh, talk about how emotional intelligence, mindfulness, uh, and any of the related uh, disciplines could impact um, or, or should guide residents of a co-living facility uh, and also leadership of a co-living facility. How can it help? Uh, how can it guide? Just right. talk about the intersection of those a little bit. Right. Well, you know, it's a great question, and I, I, I would actually answer it in such a broad way to start with, which is I think that it impacts every single human being, right? So let alone um, the people in a specific community, but it could tremendously improve the experience in a, any kind of organization or community when people are consciously developing self-awareness, meaning they actually are aware of what they're thinking feeling and doing. And then because they're aware of that, they can better manage their emotions and be um, responsive rather than reactive. And then that moves into realizing, oh my goodness, I've been really completely oblivious to what I was doing. I bet that's what everybody else is doing too. So then you develop some kind of empathy for others. I'm just going through what emotional intelligence is. So you develop 
this empathy for what others are feeling and you don't take things so personally. So just even stopping right there to just say, of course, not taking things personally is so important in a co-living situation because we are going to bump into each other. We are going to be in the kitchen when someone else needs it or on the, you know, talking too loud on our cell phone in a public, you know, shared space or whatever it might be. All of those things demand um, awareness and self-management. And then also realizing, okay, that person may not realize they're talking so loud. Maybe I could just remind them rather than getting angry at them. And so, so those three tools then develop this ability to have a better ability to be socially aware, like in larger context. And then that's a really a leadership concept because the first three are everybody needs that. But then if you're going to really be leading or um, guiding others, you need to have those three plus a certain kind of sophisticated social awareness that, that comes next. So really it's, it's important for every member of a, of a community and particularly for leaders to have the ability to um, know when to ask questions rather than make assumptions. And then again, that comes back to everybody. So on a basic level also, mindfulness and emotional intelligence imply a better ability to listen and not to just to be thinking about what you wanna say. So that's part of the self-awareness and the self-management is to open yourself up to others and really listen well. So again, all these qualities are essential really for getting along in a family, in a community, in a company, you know, anywhere. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, I'm really curious, you work with uh, companies, cor corporations and small businesses and you know culture seems to be a big cornerstone of of your work so how do you influence the culture when you're going into a population that is so diverse and coming from a lot of different backgrounds to to build that unity because i feel like that would be applicable to co-living as well right um well you know i actually one of the ways that i like to do it right because i mentioned the barrett tools is to start out with a kind of assessment called a cultural values assessment to see what is it that's important to the people in that environment. So that's something it, you definitely apply to people in a co-living environment. Um, so, so I do this cultural values assessment, which is a snapshot of what the individuals think is important, most important, how they see the environment, in this case, company culture that they're in, and what they would like that culture to be. And then we begin to see, well, here's a bridge you want it to be this, it's not this now, but look, everybody has this as their value or a lot of people have this as your value. So how could we start weaving that in? And so that leads to this training in mindfulness and emotional intelligence because in order to, to change things, you have to become aware. So one conversation leads to the next. And, so, and also, of course, generally, if I'm working with someone, if they chose me, they are interested in developing awareness and emotional intelligence. So it's not like I'm fighting against the, the wave. <laughs> right. And yeah. you're doing this assessment with everybody in the organization, not just it could at be, the top. Yeah. Well, it just depends on, on, that's why I said, okay. I love, I love small companies where they actually, yeah. can, you know, have a lot of people in the company, like maybe 50 or fewer people or a hundred or fewer people. But if, if that's not the case, it could be a division in a, mm -hmm. in a larger company. It could be a team. It, and you know, there's just three sixties for, for individuals too. So there's all these tools can be applied personally and team wise. And then sometimes it's fun to break out locations. If the company has locations in different places and realize it's not the same in Arizona as it is in Florida, as it is in Texas, right. different groups of people. Right. You mentioned something um a moment ago about asking questions rather than making assumptions mm -hmm. um it, it's an interesting point and can you elaborate a little bit on that yeah i think this comes down to um really important trait to develop which is curiosity as opposed to self-absorption i don't know how many people put those two together but when you're self-absorbed you're really only thinking about yourself. You're not that curious about what's going on with others. 
or what's going on in your world. You have a story about it and you're trying to fit everything into that paradigm because it's all about you. When you recognize, if you recognize that, that sort of selfishness, that um, limiting viewpoint, it, it actually invites curiosity, All, just the recognition. You go, wow, what have I been missing? <laughs> What's really going on here? And probably the way you ask the question is really important, um, especially if you're observing, let's say you're observing some behavior that's distasteful to you, uh, or I'll, I'll just make it first person. I'm observing something that appears to conflict with my values, or I've got an attitude about it. Um, but I don't want to just assume um, that I know what's happening. So I would ask a question. But that question could be loaded too, you know, absolutely. Um, that's part of again, that's why everything starts with self awareness. So you, you know, if you say something open ended, like, hmm, Tell me why you just did that. What's going on? Versus why did you do that? <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just like one is like, <laughs> why did you just throw out that jar of food? And you know, I, I was planning on eating that tonight. In fact, this happened to my son at one one point. He was he was a roommate with someone, and um, th this girl had been saving this leftovers of the turkey dinner from Thanksgiving for so long, he thought it smelled bad and he threw it away. And she came home and she goes, why did you throw that away? I was going to eat that. You know, she got really upset with him. But actually, if she had started with instead of like, like, what made you do that? And if he said, I smelled it and it smelled bad, then she would go, oh, good, thanks. I didn't want to get sick. Right. So, I mean, it's just a matter of we jump to a conclusion and it happens in a second. I mean, I, if I, if my, um, somebody has been to my house who, well, I have a housekeeper who comes once every two weeks and she's wonderful. She actually cleans my refrigerator out. That's unheard of, but sometimes it can be a little invasive because there's things in there that I don't want thrown out and I can get mad when I can't find it. And then I think, well, she was doing her best. She thought that that was something that was bad, or I may even jump to the conclusion. I bet Valerie threw this away. And actually, I just didn't see it there. So all the time, we're jumping to conclusions. And with the more that you see that and see all these stories I'm telling you, those are more things that can help me realize I do that. I'm aware. I do this. This is not something that I think other people shouldn't do. I do this. All the time, I do this. And so I'm curious, why do I do this? And therefore, I make an effort to say, why did you ask me that, Mark? <laughs> like, why, why are you seeing so invasive? <laughs> well, anyway, uh, my son, um, my son had the COVID virus, and he's had some of the after effects, you know, the mm -hmm. long smaller syndrome. So I asked a loaded question. I said, you know, how are you doing? You're doing better, right? <laughs> and then I went on. And my husband said to me in the background, you didn't, you didn't really ask him a good question. Mm. <laughs> so I said, oh, okay. And then I went back. My son didn't realize that my husband had said that to me. I said, you know, Alex, I think I jumped in with answering your question. Tell me how you're doing. Mm -hmm. And that yes. it wasn't my assumption. Right. My assumption was right. kind of incorrect. So that that really taught me something if i really want to know how someone's doing i have to be careful that i don't jump in with my assumption and then sort of talk over the space for them to give an answer mm -hmm. Absolutely. so so this is this is really a pervasive issue and in community we need to become aware of it or else we don't develop genuine relationships so mark where else would you like to take this interview <laughs> <laughs> Um, so here's, here's a twist I want to, uh, or a curve I'd like to throw you, Gail. We, uh, had a really interesting podcast with a couple, uh, who are both ministers 
and we talked about religion and co-living and we talked about how um it could be really divisive to have people uh practicing religious ceremonies as within the facility um and <clears throat> We talked about how divisive it could be to prohibit any sort of discussion about religion. Oh, we're going to be a religion free zone. Um, and so wh what I think the consensus was uh, near the end was that maybe we will treat religion as culture, just like just as we would share if we had an um, Native American culture or Indian, true India, Indian culture. Um, and we would all want to, pe progressive people would all want to share um, food and experiences and that sort of thing. And so we were very comfortable with that idea of um, sharing it as culture and not as ultimate truths and that sort of thing. Uh, but I could see, here, here comes the curve, um, that people who are refraining from discussing religion um, in a more proselytizing way, if you had yoga classes or if you had mindfulness classes, um, that some people might, might bristle at that and say, oh, you know, we've talked about not bringing religion in other than a celebration of culture, uh, but here we're promoting yoga, which has its roots in Hinduism, I, I, I'm not sure, um, or mindfulness, which has its roots in Buddhism. Uh, and I could see how it could cause a little bit of um, ruffled feathers. So, what do you think? And could you speak to that? Well, the first thing I thought of was it would be terrible to ban people from sharing their um, religious and cultural beliefs. Like how fun if there was somebody who regularly did Friday night um, Sabbath and they shared that with people, the foods that they, they make and the ceremony that they do, whether you be believe, whether you're Jewish or not, I mean, it's a lovely, ceremony or Christmas. I mean, of course, you'd want to have a Christmas tree, whether you were Christian or not, because it's so fun. And you, you know, want to have the grandkids or whoever in the multi generational situation come over for for uh, for their Santa Claus presence, you know, and that's not religious, that's like cultural, you know, and then I mean, so from that perspective, yeah, of course, yoga came from Hinduism. And some would say it's really missing something if it doesn't have that element in it. But my gosh, everybody has a yoga app now and it's, it's all over the place. You, you, can, you don't have to, you could just put it, you put your TV on or your, turn your cell phone on and you've got, I've got a yoga app or two. So, so if they're not, I mean, these, the, the cultural aspect of religious practices that are helpful to people have become a part of our day to day living and if you tried to sanitize that out who would want to live in such a place a prohibition against sharing what brings you some kind of joy comfort or deep spiritual satisfaction would mean that you couldn't be you so from that perspective i mean mindfulness is now being taught in every situation i mean my um we have family members who are Mormon. And this is a great example. I mean, of all the family members, and there's like people who are non-religious, people who are, um, well, all sorts of, I mean, there's so many, because there's so many people on my husband's side. But the ones who are Mormon, which is the most you know, fundamental in terms of its beliefs compared to the beliefs that we have, they're very, very different beliefs. We're the closest to them because we can share what's important to us about the religious beliefs we have. We don't have to force the other person 
to do anything. Uh, we'll watch a movie that they ask us to watch. I mean, I'm from a Jewish background and I'm Buddhist, but I'll watch a, a movie that they asked me to watch because they asked me to watch it and we can talk about it. And then interestingly, um, the, the wife in that family and her children all practice meditation. They, they practice mindfulness. They don't see it as Buddhism. So, I mean, I figure if the Mormon religion feels okay with mindfulness, like, you know, I just don't see why we would in any community like that um, tell people not to share what they do. Now, if you're trying to proselytize, that's different. And then in that sense, you know, um, we've made it clear we don't want to be proselytized to and that because that's a proselytizing religion, for instance. But um, it's not a problem. I really respect the fact that they do that, even though it's not something I would do. They're trying to share their hearts and what they think is good for people with other people. So for, that's what I mean by the empathy part. Instead of judging, oh, I would never do that. Well, I would never do that. I have a hard time writing a newsletter and sharing my thoughts because I don't want to tell people what I think too much. But that's just me. It doesn't mean that I can't understand why somebody else would feel moved to do it. So and, that's important, I think. And again, I think where we came down, and we, and we were just having a discussion about it, because part of part of what these podcasts are about are about exploring different uh, aspects that will come up in co-living, and you know, thinking about them and and planning for them. So. Um, I think clearly the consensus was that yes, let's share about share it as culture that we probably would not hold religious services um, of different denominations and and sects uh, in the facility and people need a reason to go out anyway. Yeah. Um, although I guess now uh, here towards hopefully towards the end of the pandemic. People are a lot are attending services um, virtually. Well, see, but, that's another thing. They don't, you don't, you don't have to do it. Other people are doing it for you. I, mean, I really, I don't, I, I, I agree with you, Mark. I think that trying to, to, you know, to actually be a ministry within a co-living environment would be hard to have something for everybody then, and also unnecessary because people are parts of communities that are, external to where they live and cook and eat and sleep, you know, I mean, they don't have to have everything in one place. And I think that makes it more rich. And we could easily see that it, that the community could splinter um, by having each religious service there or a number of them there in the, in the co-living facility. It would just emphasize that separateness. Okay. Here's the, Buddhist group and the Methodist group and all that. Well, so, you, know, but you know, the Westminster communities of the, okay, so it, you, you just moved to this area, but Westminster is, I don't know what, what denomination of Christianity it is, but they have several um, retirement communities on the most beautiful properties throughout the St. The Petersburg area. One of them is downtown on the bay, one of them is on the ocean, and one of them is somewhere else on the west side. I was invited there to speak about um, mindfulness meditation and maybe even Buddhism, I can't remember, but it's a Christian community. And they invited me in as a speaker to talk to them about that. So again, even if it is a religious denomination running something, if that curiosity and openness is there, it made me think, well, then probably not everybody there has to belong to that one religion because they're open and they want to know about other religions. So it's really a matter of the openness. So I, you know, I think you're going down the right track with that. And I think people will be genuinely open and, and excited about experiencing other cultures, especially if, if food is involved. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Great leveler. <laughs> Sign me up. <laughs> I'll be there. All right. Um, um, to switch gears just a little bit, I was looking at the title of your book, Gail, 
um, happier at work, the power of love to transform the workplace. And I just thought that was such an interesting concept or construct because we don't typically equate love with the workplace. Right. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. Okay, well, it has that little titillating. Um, I, it it, it pulled that, me in. <laughs> it's not that kind of love. So, um, what I was, what, where that came from was that I do teach um, meditation retreats, and I have for decades. And and I was noticing that over the last maybe fifteen to twenty years almost universally at the end of a retreat, whether it was a weekend, Friday night to Sunday, or a week or longer, people would come to me for their closing interview, practically in tears saying, oh my God, my heart is so open. How do I close it down before Monday when I go back to work? Mm -hmm. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? I can't be this open. I'll get crushed. It's just a terrible you know, situation there, my boss is this, um, everyone's competitive, I'm not allowed to bring my feelings and my, I'm feeling all my feelings. And so this came up so often that I wanted to write about that issue, how you as an individual and how you as a leader could bring more compassion and empathy into the workplace and how that would actually uplift the workplace. Everyone would be not only happier, but more productive. Absolutely. So that's that sense of, you know, mindfulness, not uh, mindfulness is a stepping stone to compassion. So as mindfulness <laughs> opens your heart and when your heart is open, then you can communicate, then you can listen, then you can collaborate, then you can have great teams, then you can be a great leader. So that was the aspect of love. I love that. And I think it completely applies to the co-living community as well maybe your next book will be the power of love to transform co-living community that would be awesome right <laughs> that'd be great happier where you live <laughs> it'd be perfect and you know i think benet brown has brought that to even a, a different level in talking about being vulnerable um it, in in all aspects of our lives, but especially being able to be vulnerable in our work setting, um, not to, I'm sure she doesn't uh, uh, recommend it to an extreme extent, but but being being a human and letting people know that, which I think can uh, encourage compassion and, and understanding. Well, you know, the old axiom was leave your feelings at the door. And it absolutely doesn't work. And, and I did a lot of research for this book. And some of the really wonderful stories were how successful leaders were who took an interest in their people. So even if it was a huge company, they had their feelers down to the floor level. And they wanted to know, this, this particular leader wanted to know if any if there was a, a serious illness or death in anybody's family. And then they personally got in touch with that person and sent some relief for their family. So it was not don't leave, not leave your feelings at the door, but please share your li life with us so we can be supportive, so we can give you leave, so we can give you whatever you need. And of course, people were so loyal and did so much more because people cared about them and let them bring their whole self, let them be vulnerable. So there's not even any point to which you should dampen your vulnerability. I mean, if you can be wholly, fully who you are, you're going to be doing your best. And it doesn't mean, you know, you have to walk around crying all the time or walk around giggling all the time. It's just that you are allowed to have those feelings and then you can manage them, you know, so you're not just spreading it. But to them, you know, and in a co-living situation, you can't tell people not to be themselves. That's where they're living. Absolutely. I think we, a lot of that comes wanted, down to safety, right? Like feeling safe to share your feelings and be authentic without being judged. And so to nurture that culture of openness in, in your living space is, is such a beautiful thing. Yeah, well, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting because Google did a study to see what was the, the overriding characteristic of teams that were the most successful 
and it was psychological safety. Interesting. And you just yeah. Hit psychological yeah. Safety. Yeah. It makes perfect sense to me. As you put yourself and imagine yourself in a co-living community, and you're you're in uh, spiritual communities and and lots of communities, and I I would suspect that you've gravitated towards a spiritual community that is as nurturing as this co-living community aspires to be. Uh, so talk a little bit about what, from, from your experience in mindfulness and um, emotional intelligence, uh, what, what could that impact be on people, residents, if we've got 50 families or 100 families um, in such a community. Um, talk about that a little bit. How could that feel? Well, I'm going to have to say people are people, whether they're spiritual and goodness is in their hearts and they want the best for each other. I think the reality is there's going to be conflict. And so that's why being vulnerable being able to acknowledge what's going on and then having the tools to deal with that and resolve it rather than ignore it and pretend, Oh, la, 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 we're just a wonderful spiritual community. Like, a, you know, um, what are they? La, la land. Well, no, I'm thinking about those communes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> communes. I mean, that's not what this is going to be. And even there, there was like, you know, obviously marijuana or whatever was trying to, the haze was trying to cover up the fact that people are different and they had different needs. And some people are messy and some people are neat. And some people can't stand the people who are messy. And some people are annoyed by the people who are neat. And so there's going to be stuff. There's going to be real stuff in a community when you get different families and different family cultural cultures and different religions and all of that together in one space. And I think the most important thing is, is to have that curiosity and openness and want to know about other people. Because if you want to be just surrounded by people just like you, just you better live with just yourself <laughs> because we're all different. So I think that's the biggest challenge is getting over some idea of perfection or, you know, nirvana land that this is going to be. I think it's a bold experiment. I think there's a, there could be a lot of benefits. Um, and we can look to, you know, kibbutzes and other places where these social experiments have happened and just to learn from them where it worked and where, where it needed um, to be tweaked. By the way, um, the concept does uh, involve uh, an in-house mediation program um, to teach all of us how to facilitate uh, agreements. It'll also make us better negotiators by going through that, um, that training. Yeah. And my hope is that enough people will be interested in pursuing it that we might be able to offer that service to the broader neighborhood and, and city and, um, and have it be a revenue source for the individuals as well as for the mm -hmm. community and defray some of the HOA expenses uh, as well as other things, hydroponics, uh, aquaponics, um, maybe some other gardening uh, to, to actually provide some goods and services uh, and not just consume. Yeah, sounds great. I mean, I'm, I'm hoping you get this up and running soon, <laughs> especially because it's going to be near me. So, <laughs> Gail, is there anything we haven't asked you about in this interview that you would like to share with us? Tips or advice or experience? Well, I would just say that, um, you know, earlier before we started recording, you were asking me, you were telling me about your sort of um, ideal client and what you enjoy oh, helping I was. people with, right? Right. And so I, I would say that the theme that I'm seeing that is really important, um, and it would be important for every individual, whether they're in this community or not, but is to, to pay attention to how you talk to yourself about things. So I would say that self-confidence, 
and the, the, the lack of belief in oneself to accomplish what you want to accomplish, such as being able to live in a community like this successfully or being able to navigate the difficulties or whatever they might be, that working on your own um, self-confidence and belief in what's important to you and not letting your um, stories about what's going on get in the way. So once again, it's getting out of self-absorption and taking a bigger view and then realizing, okay, what is it going to take to make this work? And that only a confident person can take that step out of doubt into action. So I think that um, all the members of this community are going to have to work on that aspect of, I don't know what this is going to be. I'm not sure I'm willing to take a chance on something new and then have confidence that their, their inspiration to participate is the part of what's going to make it great. Love it. I think that the audience we're trying to cultivate are, you know, more of the trendsetters, the, um, you know, travelers, the up and coming uh, connectors. Would I know, you say but that, you know, I'm just going to tell you, there isn't one person from the highest CEO that I've ever worked with mm -hmm. to a beginning, just out of college person who doesn't suffer from self doubt. Oh, I yeah. Oh, I know that. <laughs> so <laughs> Every or, client I whatever, have, <laughs> they're still going to, they're, they're, you know, yeah. A, a lot of us cover it up yes. with bravado, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and, 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 you know, this is really, really critical to take the time to look inside. And, you know, this is, again, this is coming back to an aspect of mindfulness. So, um, absolutely. Yeah. Love it. Um, Mark. You know, I, I, I've since we're about ready to wrap up, but let's talk about imposter syndrome a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, my, uh, because I think that's what we're saying without, without naming it. Um, I had a recurring dream uh, for years that I was one course short of graduation from college. And I was running, I, I had the same dream. I was running around to the registrar and trying to get that extra course. Um, talk about, and, and that's my interpretation, was I, I, I'm not qualified. Um, so talk about other manifestations of that, because what I hear you saying is having confidence, a sufficient level of confidence, not overconfidence, not cockiness, but confidence in oneself and our own competence is, is crucial for personal growth and happiness and being in, involved in a community like this. So, That's right. Or either so, of you, because both I, of you. I actually with did it. a whole meditation, you know, like it's a week long thing on, on, on imposter syndrome. It's on simple habit. But in any case, I think that all of us feel in some area of our life or in many areas of life of life, I'm not enough. And that I'm not enough actually won't be filled by getting another degree, by finishing and getting that class, <laughs> by, get, you know, by getting another certification, by you know, having someone else fall in love with you. It isn't something that can be filled from the outside. So the kind of confidence that I work with people on is their fundamental nature is good enough. You as who you are, are fundamentally good just as you are. So it's getting to this deeper place of accepting yourself that allows you to realize I can go ahead and get that other degree because I'm interested in learning, but not because it's going to make me a better person. So you're not actually trying to become better. You start from who I am. My fundamental nature as a human being is just right for me. This is who I'm supposed to be. And that's a different kind of confidence. I refer to myself as perfectly human uh, sometimes in that. Well, that's in that a great way of saying it. Um, well, thanks so much, Gail. Uh, shall we? Let's let's uh, have you summarize how people can get in touch with you, and we'll we'll put these in the show notes. Talk about your website and your book and where that's available, and. Um, 
how, how can people get in touch with you? Okay, well, you can get in touch with me um, at Gail, G-A-Y-L-E, at transformyourculture.com, or even my, my other email, which is not as fancy, just gailvangills at gmail.com. <laughs> <laughs> but that confuses me a little bit, but anyway. So I have those two emails. Um, my book is Happier at Work, The Power of Love to Transform the Workplace, and the easiest place to get it is Amazon. Um, it's there in both Kindle and um, a paperback. Uh, what else? Your you, can, oh, you can get a bunch of freebies. If you go to my website, you can sign up for um, one of the Barrett Personal Values Assessment. I'll do a, I'll do a, um, a you'll get a big report and I'll do a personal um, coaching session with you on it. So if either of you want that, you just sign up on my website. It's under transformyourculture.com slash book because it's in the book. So yeah. <laughs> um, I, I can't remember what else you asked, but Basically, I'm doing new things all the time. Uh, right now, um, one of the things I'm doing, which is really interesting, is um, I have something on Instagram, and I tag it as my confidence project. It's uh, Gail, at Gail Van Gills on Instagram. So I'll for, follow you because I'm on Instagram, Instagram too. <laughs> yeah, when I started my Instagram, I was doing you know Instagram videos and you know things like that. This year for Christmas, my husband gave me a pad of paper and some marker pens and some like really nice black felt drawing pens or whatever they are. They're like Japanese calligraphy pens. And I said, oh, that's nice, honey. <laughs> and about two days later, he said to me, um, I think I didn't explain why I gave you that gift. He my, my art form is clay or was clay. So I always, you know, I have kilns and I used to work in clay and I made big sculptures and stuff. I haven't done it for a long time because I don't have a studio in this house and I couldn't go to the art studio. So he said, I thought you might want to draw. And I, my answer was, I can't draw. And I went, boom, a confidence challenge. That's the kind <laughs> of thing I work with with my clients. So I created this thing called my confidence challenge for myself. So every single day since January oh, I 1st, that. I have drawn something and posted it on Instagram. Awesome. And, and you know, I really need to write about it so other people will join me because that's why I made that, that hashtag up. Nobody else uses it. But it is, so, it is so fun because I'm actually becoming a pretty good artist. I mean, if I do say so myself. That's amazing. It's like crazy. <laughs> you put your attention on something and you yeah. do it every single day. Yeah. It doesn't matter what kind of belief you had about yourself. It's going to dissolve because it's not true. It's so funny that you mentioned that because I have a desire to learn calligraphy for handwriting. And I just, and right now I stink at it. <laughs> oh, great. Well, join the challenge. That would be so I will. Exciting. I will. <laughs> now, go, All come, right. come get in touch with me after this. Um, also, All let's right. see how, how can you, yeah, just email me. Your email. Um, then yeah. We'll, we'll figure it out. All right. That's fun. Oh. Very cool. Yeah. Awesome. Gail, thanks so much uh, for being yeah, with us thank today. You. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mark. And keep an eye out in your life for people who would be interested in our concept, who have something to offer like you did today uh, about mindfulness and emotional intelligence and, okay. and all the ways that you contributed. And refer them to us because we're exploring um, mm -hmm. all these different aspects of the community, um, including just sharing our last or recent podcast uh, was from a, uh, a local person in the St. Pete area who found himself going from corporate exec to homelessness and oh. uh, discovered some uh, his own way out with some support, but mostly through his own efforts and shared that story and the the power of transformation that he went through to get to, to, to become okay. So, uh, and, and once we have our physical facility, we'll definitely be bringing in resources for all sorts of things to share in the community. So go ahead and share them. We're, that's, that's what this podcast is oh, about. I totally will. I, I love it. I love your project. Um, I'm looking forward to it coming to fruition and contributing in any way that I can. So 
Thank you for allowing me to awesome. be part of it. Jennifer, obviously we're going to become friends. So yes, I know, right? Of course. Mark and I already <laughs> have crossed that line. So <laughs> I know I, I have to make my way back to Florida and meet all of these cool people in real life. <laughs> it's, uh, well, it, you know, this is a great town. So it's a good place. I know. To I know. I have visited, but I. Um, and Jennifer, you'll have to come visit to your mom, who wants to be our first resident. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> wonderful. Exactly. Wonderful. Absolutely. Oh, don't want... forget, Jennifer. To here, let me let me. I talk. know. I was going to say, had... Mark. <laughs> we need I you to show off your your swag. Yeah. Oh, there's great. a Thrive Co Living Communities T-shirt, which is available on the Thrive Co Living Communities org website. <laughs> along with other things like masks and uh i don't know what else sweatshirts do we have doggy coats or <laughs> shirts or anything do we? i can't also, remember what a else. little puppy poop bag right now yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh that's a good idea <laughs> branded poop bags <laughs> oh yeah well um Let's see, also on the website is a GoFundMe campaign, right, where, that people can contribute to, mm -hmm. as well as subscribe to our newsletter to stay updated on all of these great interviews that we are doing, among other things, progress and news about Thrive Co-Living. And let me, let me also point out, we completed our first uh, grant application to uh, foundations, two foundations. Um, so. Uh, if our listeners will keep their ears open for grant opportunities um, oh, that support some aspect of our plan, whether it be sustainability or inclusion or multi-generational living, um, we, we feel like, or we know there are plenty of foundations and we're, we're applying about every other week um, uh, starting uh, several weeks ago for awesome. these foundation grants. We only need about $35,000 for our first raise. Um, so if you're aware of any any that uh, have some money to share for our cause, please let us know, in, anyone awesome. in the, who's listening. Yeah, and if, if, if a listener does um, is aware of one, what is your email address for them? Uh, Mark let you at thrivecolivingcommunities.org. Perfect. Awesome. I think that's a wrap. What do you think? <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you Gail. Yeah. Really appreciate it. Thanks for joining this episode of the Thrive Co-Living podcast and YouTube broadcast. To discover more about our mission and activities, please visit our website at thrivecolivingcommunities.org. There, you can also learn how you can support our creative vision and co-living communities. We also ask that you subscribe to the Thrive Co-Living Communities YouTube channel and or the Thrive Co-Living Communities podcast. Thanks again for tuning in. We will be back soon.